Hi, my name's uh, Professor Michael Cox. I'm at the LSE. I've been in the International Relations Department at the school for 15 years. And uh, over the last few years, I've been co-director and now director of the LSE's think tank, uh, LSE Ideas. Over the last two or three years, however, I've been writing a history of the LSE, attempting to not replace the great book by Ralph Darendorf, who was the eighth director, but also to uh, rethink some of the uh, history of the LSE. And one of the things I've been doing here today in New Delhi, at the South Asia Centre Forum and Conference, is to think about the relationship between India and the LSE and the long intimate, close relationship, which goes right back to before the First World War, continues very importantly between the two wars, and of course continues in the post-war period and continues today. So this is a long and very close relationship uh, between India and the LSE. Before the First World War, there was very big, one very, two very big things happened. Uh, Beatrice and Sidney Webb visited India in 1912. Uh, which they found a fascinating country, and they were highly critical, by the way, of British rule in, in India. They were certainly not uh, apologists for the way the British were running India, far from it. Nearly all of their comments were highly critical. And they were fascinated by India and rather sympathetic to uh, what was going on in India. They had criticisms to be made, to be sure. But while they were here, they also met uh, Rajan Tata and they met the uh, representatives of the Tata family, and who were wanting to donate money to the study of de deprivation and poverty. They couldn't establish it in India, it seems because British authorities were suspicious of such, such a thing, thinking it would turn into a criticism of their position in India, uh, which probably was true. And so the money then came to the University of London, which then set up really social, science, social services and social policy in Britain. And you could almost say, ironically, it was India through the Tatars who provided the beginnings of the, the, the academic study of social policy, social administration, and indeed continued to do so until 1932. So that's a very important part of the history of the LSE, and indeed of the history of the growth of welfare and the welfare state and, and discussions about poverty and deprivation in Britain. It should have happened in India, I think, uh, but it happened to happen in, in, in Britain, and it couldn't have happened at a better place than at the LSE, where there were a number of people deeply interested in those kinds of social and economic questions in ways that, say, Oxford and Cambridge were clearly not. And that, that's what marked the LSE out. And that's why the Tartars and the Tartar Foundation people were very interested in the LSE and wanted to give it support. Um, so that's one big turning point in the history of the school. And by the way, one of the, one of the people who became a tutor in 1912 uh, was Clement Attlee. He was then a social worker in the East End of London. He was a barrister. He had worked with the poor and the deprived in the East End of London. He later, of course, became deputy leader of the Labour Party, then leader of the Labour Party in the 1930s, and, of course, became prime minister of the Labour, Labour government in 1945. And it was under the Labour government, of course, that India acquired independence. Now, I always say India acquired independence by itself. It wasn't given to them by anybody. And I always make this clear. It'd be wrong to say Clement Attlee gave India back to Indians. That would be a completely wrong way of putting it. But I'm very pleased that it was Clement Attlee who was Prime Minister in 1945, rather than Winston Churchill, because Churchill, I think, took a rather different and distinctly imperialist view about India. So there was that, there was that connection, too, which ran into, into Clement Attlee. In the interwar period, we see a new face of the relationship. And that, of course, is World War I. There's been the Russian Revolution. India, there's increasing radicalization after Amritsar. Uh, various laws are passed in, by the British in India, which are highly repressive, particularly in the Punjab. Um, and in a way, what we're seeing is the world being turned upside down by World War I, both in Britain and in the world, and of course within India. And so we get a new generation of new, new Indian students coming to the LSE from the 20s onwards, right into the, through the interwar period, and they come to the LSE because they believe the LSE has a tradition of critical thinking. And there's one man at the LSE with whom they, in a sense, almost intellectually and politically admire more than any other. And that was the great uh, radical and socialist writer on international relations and more, more obviously on political theory, Harold Lasky, who came to the school in 1920 and remained a key figure at the school until 1950. Key member of the Labour government, a key member of the Labour Party rather, not so much the government. But he, he was very, very popular in the Labour Party, and he worked very closely with a number of the, uh, 
of, of those who went on to become key people in, in India, independent, particularly Krishna Menon. And Krishna Menon, of course, was a very close comrade in arms and a comrade uh, to, to Nehru, the first prime minister. Nehru knew Lasky. And that, again, gave, gave the LSE a certain uh, political importance in the history of India because it was so much associated with Indian independence. And I've always said, you know, thank, thank goodness for Lasky in some ways because he, he kind of made it, you know, really possible, you know, for, for British people not to be seen just as people who were imperialist or, or pro-empire. And indeed, the labour movement as a whole played a big role in that, and, and Lasky was part of that. There were, of course, other Indians who came in that period. Most significantly, I suppose, was Ambedkar, who came in the 1920s. He wrote a PhD on the rupee, uh, which was first of all rejected because it was regarded as being too, too anti-imperialist. There you go. Uh, but it, he referred it, and he, he finally got his PhD. So Ambedkar was there, and many, many others who went on in, in, in the post-war period to become key figures. So that's a very important part of the history. And also the number of students who come is, is very high. The, the biggest group of non-British students who come to the LSE in the interwar period are actually coming from India, I, United India at that time, which also included later what we would know as Pakistan and Burma. And then there's the post-war period. The numbers fall away, but they rise again in the 50s and the 60s. I would say the relationship becomes less intimate, less close, because the numbers of students now coming to the school from outside, increasingly they're coming from the United States and North America, by the 50s and 60s, they're coming increasingly from, from Europe. Uh, but the Indian students still remain a, a crucial part of the story of the LSE. And the other, two other parts of that story, one is the number of academics and teachers who remain you know, in, either from India or with a deep interest in Indian, in Indian questions. The very first, one of the very first people at the LSE going back to the interwar period, but she continued to work at the LSE until the 1960s, was a woman called Vera Anstey. And she was absolutely fantastic. And there were many others who followed her. And, and again, there was that great interest in India and the role of Indian academics and Indian intellectuals to the school. Amartya Sen, Meghnad Desai, many, many others, Indian and non-Indian. So that tradition continues. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that uh, after a little bit of a lapse, if you like, in the relationship, not a lapse, but a kind of quietening down of that relationship, we're going to see a new phase in, in the development of improved uh, Anglo-Indian relations and also relations between the LSE because Indian students, students coming from South Asia generally, are a crucial part of what makes the LSE the LSE.